explore one of the most popular topics in Bible prophecy. Many people who don't know anything else about Bible prophecy have all heard about the Magog invasion in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Many people are startled to discover there are other chapters in Ezekiel too. But in any case, the book of Ezekiel, full of the present uh, judgments on Jerusalem at that time, but then he outlines the future destinies of the nations focusing on the restoration of Israel. And that's also where we find another very famous prophecy in Ezekiel 37, the famed dry bones vision, which fortunately is interpreted for us in that passage. It's the regathering of the state of Israel and uh, the valley of dry bones. They're brought back to life in the flesh in that vision, and then later they'll be breathed with the Spirit of God in those two steps, actually. And uh, it's interesting in Isaiah 11:11 11, 11, we have a reference to the same thing with an interesting phrase in there. In Isaiah 11:11 11, 11, it says, "The Lord shall set His hand again the second time to recover the remnant of His people." And then it goes on. The second time. See, the first time was when they were regathered after the Babylonian captivity, back in the fifth uh, century, fifth and sixth century. And uh, but the second time is what we're experiencing in our lifetime. The, the birth of a nation born in a day. And of course, so this passage in Ezekiel 37 was fulfilled in the first half of the 20th century with the restoration of Israel, the second time. Now, why is Israel to be restored? In chapter 36, there is an explanation that's fundamental to our understanding the events that are going to take place and that we're going to review tonight. So let's take a look at Ezekiel 36, starting at about verse 16. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, that's an expression that Ezekiel uses all through his passage of himself, <clears throat> saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings, their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman. Wherefore I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land, for their idols wherewith they had polluted it. And I scattered them among the heathen, and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way and according to their doings, I judged them. He's talking about the diaspora. And when they entered into the heathen, whither they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said to them, these are the people of the Lord and are gone forth out of his land. See, it's interesting, every time Israel is not in the land, that's in effect uh, profaning the word of God, because that's where they were supposed to be and they weren't. These are the people of the Lord and they're gone forth out of his land. But, God continues, but I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen whither they went. Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen whither ye went. It's interesting. He's going to take care of them, not because they deserve it, but because his name is on the deal. I think that's fascinating. God continues, I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. And we've been watching that in the second half of the 20th century and continuing. So the book of Ezekiel has the famous dry bones vision, chapters 36 and 37. It also concludes 
the, for chapters 40 through 48 that finish the book of Israel deal with the millennium, the kingdom that God is going to set up on the planet earth through which he's going to rule the planet earth. The millennial temple is described, Ezekiel 40 through 48. Highly detailed. So it's not just a symbolic thing. It's a literal description. All nations, not just Israel, all nations are destined to worship there. Offerings and sacrifices will be resumed. This puzzles many scholars. One of the things to take a note here, that that millennial temple will only be open on Shabbat, on Saturday, and on new moons. That's interesting. But the point I'm getting at is there is a very key event that occurs after chapter 37 and before chapter 40. And that's chapter 38 and 39, specifically the Magog invasion. So we have the Valley of the Dry Bones in chapter 36 and 37, the Millennium in 40 through 48. Between those, we have Gog and Magog. And that's exactly what we're going to explore in this briefing. This is famous for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's the occasion in which God himself intervenes to quell this ill-fated invasion by Magog and his allies. And the allies include Persia, Cush, Put, Libya, Gomer, Tagarma, Meshech, and Tubal. And the second reason it's so well known by so many, this passage, even though it was written over 2,500 years ago, seems to describe the use of nuclear weapons. And so, first of all, let's talk about what I'll call the Magog identity. Who on earth is Magog? See, Ezekiel 38 opens up, first three verses. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. Well, the first thing we want to explore, why does the Bible always use these weird names? Everywhere you go, there are these Gog and Magog and so forth. There was a city many years ago called Petrograd. And then for many, many years, it was called St. Petersburg. Then for many years, it was called Leningrad. Now it's called St. Petersburg again. And um, what's it going to be called next year? My friends in Russia remind me that in Russia, even the past is uncertain. And so in, uh, uh, there was a town called Byzantium that became the capital of the world when Constantine moved the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome to uh, Byzantium and renamed it Constantinople as the New Rome. And uh, about a millennium and a half later, about 1,450 years later, the Muslims overran it and renamed it Istanbul. See, we keep changing the names of things. So what do you do if you're Isaiah and God calls upon you to talk about the Persian Empire over a century before it surfaces in history? How do you refer to it? Well, by the ancestors. Uh, you call it Elam. In Isaiah 11 and 21 and 22, you'll find that. See, you and I change the names of everything, but there's one thing we don't change the names of, and that's our ancestors. So if you're going to try to talk about a people, biblically, then the safe way to refer to that people is by the name of their ancestors. And that's exactly what we have. We have Noah. All of us in this room are relatives. Did you know that? We, don't, we not only go back to Adam, we all go back to Noah. We're really relatives. Perhaps that's why we don't get along any better. But he had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And their sons are detailed in Genesis 10 and also in 1 Chronicles 1. And obviously, we're going to be dealing with Magog, who's one of the sons of Japheth. He's a grandson of Noah himself. And there's many others that we'll be dealing with. But let's go back. Ezekiel wrote in the 7th century B.C., there was a guy that wrote in the 8th century B.C., a guy by the name of Hesiod. And uh, he was a Greek poet who occupies a very unique place in Greek literature, for, both for his moral precepts and his highly personal tone. He was known in what's called a didactic poet. He wrote poetry that's intended to instruct, not just entertain. 
He was born in Askrab, Boeotia, which is now a fellow Pagania, for those of you that might be worried about that. <laughs> after, his death of his, after the death of his father, he settled in Nabaktas, and then in, in his youth he tended sheep and led the life of a farmer. Except for what he reveals of himself, we really know very little about his life. Modern scholars place him in the same period of Greek literature as Homer, with his Iliad and Odyssey and so forth. And he's credited with composing works in the days, the earliest example of didactic poetry. Poetry meant to be instructive rather than entertaining. Now, the reason we bring him up is he speaks of the Magogians, the sons of Magog, by their Greek name, the Scythians. So he's a very early authority of the identity of, the, uh, of Magog. There's another guy that wrote a couple of hundred years later by the name of Herodotus. In fact, he is known as the father of history. Very, very prolific writer. He traveled extensively throughout the Mediterranean world and observing all the different peoples he encountered and studying the military history of the region. And uh, to the Greeks, they were very interested in that and he, he, his, his uh, military background was very important to them. And he produced a narrative compilation of his findings which he entitled History. And as I say, he's known as the father of history. A number of archaeological discoveries have clearly confirmed Herodotus' reports in general and his Scythian reports in particular. And uh, now there's another guy that you'll want to be aware of, and that's Philo Judaeus. He's sometimes called Philo of Alexandria. Now he's somewhat con almost contemporaneous with the New Testament period. Uh, he was considered one of the greatest Jewish philosophers of his age. And he appropriated so completely the doctrines of Greek philosophy that he's also considered really a Greek philosopher who combined elements uh, borrowed from both sides, if you will. And uh, he was born in Alexandria to a very wealthy aristocratic family. And he received his education in the Old Testament and in Greek literature, both. And uh, he had an intimate knowledge of Homer and the other Greek uh, writers. And, uh, but, uh, and his chief studies were Greek philosophy especially the teaching of the Pythagoreans and, the, uh, and Plato and the Stoics. Another authority that makes reference that we're going to refer to here is Josephus, or Flavius Josephus, Jewish historian born in Jerusalem of both royal and priestly background. His original name was Joseph ben Matthias, incidentally. He was a man both learned and worldly. He was a member of the Pharisees and also a very public figure who before the Jewish revolt against Rome had made friends at the court of Emperor Nero. He uh, uh, felt that the uh, parts played by the zealots and, uh, and uh, their opponents, the Pharisees, considered the whole uh, uh, attempt to fight Rome futile. And uh, this led to ambiguity in the historical record of the role of Josephus, a Pharisee, uh, in the conflict. His own writings represent two conflicting accounts of his mission in the province of the Galilee. Two conflicting accounts. According to one account, he took command of the Jewish forces to lead a Galilean phase of the revolt. In another account, uh, it contends that he sought to subdue the revolt rather than to lead it. Whichever story may be true, uh, it apparently prepared the Galilee for the coming onslaught in the, in the year of 67, in which they uh, repulsed the advance of Vespasian, the Roman general, who was soon to become emperor, uh, defending the fortress of uh, Jatapada for about 47 days before surrendering. But here's where he gets very clever. He would have been sent as a prisoner to Nero had he not had the wit to prophesy that his captor, Vespasian, would himself one day be emperor. He predicted that, and Vespasian was. His son Titus was, would then take over. And this, uh, this of course, uh, is prophesying this, you know, accorded with Vespasian's ambitions. So the general kept jo uh, Josephus with him, thus saving his life. And that while he was Vespasian's prisoner... He oversaw the, the, or he watched, the subjugation of Galilee and Judea. And he, subsequently he was freed, and he adopted Vespasian's family name, Flavius, as his own. That's where he gets that, that name. And uh, he then accompanied another emperor, namely Vespasian's son, Titus, and he witnesses Titus's uh, siege of Jerusalem, the famous fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So his records are of incredible value to us. And uh, so thereafter, he enjoyed imperial patronage under Titus and his brother's successor, Domitian. He lived until his death in Rome and devoted himself to his writing. 
very prolific writer, wrote documents that are very important to us. His, his writings even record uh, the presence of Jesus Christ and also James, uh, Christ's brother. His works include The War of the Jews, that's seven volumes, The Antiquities of the Jews, uh, his summary of the whole history of uh, Judaism in 20 volumes, and uh, his own autobiography, and a rebuttal to some criticism before. The last one is invaluable because Josephus recapitulates the writings on Jewish history that we no longer have available. In his book Antiquities, the key first uh, verse for us today is, he says, Magog founded the Magogians, thus named after him, but were by the Greeks called Scythians. So there again, we get the equivalency of the word Scythian with the biblical term of Magog. So that's the Magog identity. Hesiod, the Greek didactic poet in the 8th century, makes reference to it. Herodotus, the father of history, uh, says the, essentially the same thing. Philo and Josephus not only mention it, but they link that to the Great Wall of China, which was built to keep them out. They're, they use the term, the ramparts of Gog and Magog, for the Wall of China. And, of course, we're the beneficiary of all the discoveries by the Soviet archaeologists who have found thousands of graves called Kurgans, frozen in the Siberia, where you've got 2,500-year-old graves that are frozen and therefore useful for understanding their lifestyle and the rest of it. But even if you didn't know any of this, we know that Magog is going to launch his attack from the uttermost parts of the north. And if you go north of Israel, obviously, you are in the southern steppes of Russia and so forth. The steppes of history, if I can use a pun here. See, the various descendants of Magog terrorized the southern steppes of Russia from the Ukraine all the way to China. And, uh, uh, and they did this from the 10th century B.C. to about the 3rd century B.C. For about seven centuries there, they were a very dominant factor in that geography. And the Great Wall of China was built to keep uh, Magog out, if you will. And so uh, there's a long history here. Going way back, there is a people called the Urartu in the 9th century B.C. This goes back a bit. A number of nomadic tribes created a new state in the region of Lake Van in present-day Turkey, which immediately became a competitor to the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians called this state Urartu. And it quickly became powerful in the first half of the 8th century B.C. It extended its rule over a wide area. Now, Assyria could not stand by indifferently as Uartu expanded and grew more powerfully. Uh, so, during the reign of a, a very key leader, the Assyrians undertook two campaigns against Uartu in, in the 8th century B.C. And um, two ca campaigns. In the second, they reached and besieged the Uartan capital of Tushba. And the two groups frequently referred to in the Urartan texts and in the Assyrian text, the Sumerians and the Scythians. These two ancient peoples are surprisingly well documented in these things. They both figure very frequently in subsequent identifications. The Sumerians. They're the oldest of the European tribes living north of the Black Sea and the Danube. And we know them by the name that they used for themselves. And their history... Uh, of the southern Ukraine began in about the late 11th century BC. And they were the first specialized horse nomads to make their name in history. They were among the first people that domesticated the horse and created a horseback culture, if you will. And uh, the earliest skeletal evidence of domestication of the horse occurs south of Kiev about 2500 BC. That really goes back a bit. And their nomadic lifestyle, including mounted warriors, fully developed between the 10th and 8th centuries. And uh, they were the first mentioned uh, in the secular literature, the Odyssey and the Iliad of Homer, 8th century BC, and other cuneiform texts of the uh, Syrian Empire, and of course by Herodotus in detail. And uh, Herodotus indicates the whole North, Steppe, uh, North uh, Pontic Steppe region was, uh, was occupied in this time by the Scythians belonging to the Sumerians. And uh, scholars, in fact, suspect that the name Crimea for the Crimean Peninsula came from the Sumerians. And uh, they surged in Asia Minor in the late 7th century, annihilated the Phrygian uh, kingdom after destroying and looting its capital, Gordium. And uh, they captured Sardis and uh, plundered the Greek cities at the Aegean coast and Asia Minor. And in the early 7th century, Sumerian forces were checked and routed by the Assyrians who came to the aid of the Scythians. And by the 6th century, the Sumerians disappeared from the historical scene. 
By the 5th century, the Sumerians were driven south over the Caucasus by the Scythians in a domino-like effect because the Scythians themselves were being pushed westward by other tribes. And all this can be co uh, coordinated with the Chinese records, interestingly enough. There are numerous references in the Talmud that have left little doubt that the descendants of Gomer then moved northward and established themselves in the Rhine and Danube valleys. The name Scythian then designates a number of nomadic tribes from the Russian steppes, one group of which invaded the Near East in the 8th and 7th century, and they're depicted in their legends, this is interesting, as descending from the Scythies, the youngest of three sons of Hercules, these are all fictitious people, uh, from sleeping with a half-viper and half-woman. It's interesting, notice how frequently a woman in the ancient mythology is linked with a serpent. I think that's kind of fascinating. Same thing, similar legends surrounded Alexander the Great and so forth. Anyway, after being repulsed from Media, many of the later Scythes settled in the fertile area of the Ukraine, north of the Black Sea. Other later tribes went to the east of the Caspian Sea. Herodotus then describes their own country called Scythia. It was a square, about 20 days' journey, call it 360 uh, miles on a side. It encompassed the lower reaches of the Dniester, the Bug, the Dnieper, and the Don Rivers, where they flow into the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov. The Scythian language belonged to the Iranian family of Indo-European languages. Deep roots here on both sides. The original area in which Iranian was spoken extended from mid-Volga to the Don regions uh, to the northern Urals and beyond. And from here, the Iranian-speaking tribes colonized Media, Parthia, Persia, Central Asia, as far as the Chinese border. The ancient writers, as I mentioned before, refer to the Great Wall of China as Sudyogog et Magog, the ramparts of Gog and Magog. And uh, so their speech is a form of Iranian, one of the branches of the Indo-European languages. They kept herds of horses, cattle, sheep, lived in tent-covered wagons, fought unexcelled in the use of bows and arrows on horseback. The Scythians developed archery to a level that's never been equaled. One of the trademarks of a Scythian warrior is that he could, while riding on horseback, bring down a bird in flight with his bow and arrow, left or right-handed. And uh, when a Scythian child could first walk, he was handed a bow. And they developed archery to a level of, uh, of competence and proficiency never equaled elsewhere. The Parthians tried to come close, but didn't make it. The Scyth when you see in a museum, if you see a vase with a, a, horse, a, a, a warrior rider riding, shooting an arrow backwards, and you might find a bird, maybe not, that's a, a, a symbol, a trademark, if you will, of the Scythian warrior. And a very, very formidable people. They developed a very rich culture, uh, opulent tombs, metalwork, and a brilliant art style. Very, very interesting culture to study. In the 7th century, the Scythians advanced south of the Caspian Sea, invaded the kingdom of Media, but they were expelled in 625 by Xerxes, the king of Media. And shortly after the 4th century BC, the Scythians of southeastern Europe were subdued, largely exterminated by the Samartians, which then gave their name to the region. So they're earlier than that. And uh, the Scythian tr tribes in Asia, however, invaded the Parthian Empire. That was the successor to the Persian Empire. Southeast of the Caspian Sea in the 2nd century BC, in about 130 BC, they advanced eastward to the kingdom of Bactria, the region of the present-day Afghanistan, and in the first century BC, they invaded western and northern India, where they remained powerful for about five centuries. So in the seventh century BC, they swept across the area, displacing the Sumerians from the steppes of the Ukraine, eastern Ipur, who fled then across the Caucasus by way of summary. This is Herodotus' summary of it. Even the name Caucasus appears to have been derived from Gog Hassan, or Gog's fort. The, the, now, interesting, they, uh, the hippo Mogoi, they, they, milk, they milk horses for milk, are mentioned in Homer's Iliad, and uh, the, where the equestrian nomads of the northern steppes, several authorities identify these with Scythians. When I was, I had the opportunity to be the guest of the, uh, of, uh, the deputy chairman of the uh, Soviet Union, while uh, uh, be, uh, with him, he extended to me uh, the, um, uh, one of the delicacies I was offered was fermented horse milk. So it seems these traditions have very, very deep roots indeed. According to both Herodotus and the archaeological evidence, Scythians occupied territory, for, territory from the Danube to the Don. The northern boundary extended beyond the latitude of Kiev in, in Russia. So this is... Now, tombs tell tales. 
The, Scythians, uh, the Scythian culture extended more than 2,000 miles east from the Ukraine. And this has been demonstrated by the sensational discovery in the Chalikta Valley of East uh, Kazakhstan in uh, 1965. And as the experts point out, they proved that the Scythian culture had spread to the Mongolian border as early as the 6th century BC. And uh, there are countless uh, Scythian burial sites that have been covered both north and east of the Black Sea, ranging from the 6th through the 2nd centuries. More than 1,200 graves have been investigated uh, by the institutes and so forth that specialize in this sort of thing. They're the ones that take care of Lenin's tomb and all that. And uh, the, these remarkable circumstances, because they're frozen tombs, um, they, they, they preserve the textiles, the remains of the horses, human skin, hair, entrails, undigested food, and so forth, for more than 2,300 years. So this allows the scientists to understand their lifestyle. They can tell what they ate and how they lived and so forth. They buried their horses with the warriors, by the way. So that's how that's such a, a relevant aspect. There is a concept that has its roots in the Scythians that you'll be interested to watch even to this day. It's a concept called defense in depth. One reason Herodotus gave us so much detailed information about the Scythians was that he wanted to describe the people who had succeeded in defeating the Persian king Darius. And Darius the first crossed the Bosphorus and invaded Scythia. The Scythians, however, had devised an unusual tactic for conducting warfare. The Persians expected to crush the Scythians in a decisive engagement. But the Scythians avoided such a battle. They retreated deep into their own territory, laying waste the region and wearing down the enemy by means of small raids. In pursuing the Scythians, Darius soon came to appreciate the cunning of these partisan tactics. Reaching the Volga, the Darius acknowledging defeat had to retreat from Scythia in shame. And Herodotus deals with this because the Greeks wanted to really understand that. Well, when you get to 1812, a guy by the name of Napoleon entered Russia. And Field Marshal Kutusov's similar strategy, even to the burning of Moscow, resulted in reducing Napoleon's Grand Armée from 453,000 down to 10,000. Because they just kept retreating, even leaving Moscow themselves burning as Napoleon goes there to receive the surrender, there's no one there to surrender. And he, it takes him a while to realize the ingenuity here because the Russian winter sets in. And he, could all, he, 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 he was able to survive with a mere 10,000. And that whole uh, uh, event, that infamous defeat, is now commemorated in Tchaikovsky's Overture to 1812. That's really what it's all about, celebrating this. You say, well, don't they ever learn? You get to the World War II. 1941, Hitler suffered a similar defeat from the same Scythian strategy, pressing a quick advance deep into the Russian interior only to have his Wehrmacht swallowed up in the harsh Russian winter. What's that got to do today? We'll tell you in the next session because we're going to explore the current uh, Andropov doctrine in part two of this briefing. That comes later. It's interesting that the Scythians are mentioned in the New Testament. Because Paul says in Colossians 3.11, he says, Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all in all. You and I don't relate to that verse because we don't have the cultural depth here. But a barbarian is one thing. The Scythian was used as the ultimate extreme of a barbarian. That word used this way would strike shock to the reader, to Paul's reader. And uh, because even a Scythian... Not only a barbarian, even a Scythian can uh, uh, receive Christ. So there's hope for us. Because you and I are in the same boat. We too can receive Christ, no matter how Scythian we might be. The depth of the Scythian background has endowed the Russian people with the beauty of Pushkin, Dostoevsky, and Tchaikovsky on the one hand, but has also given them the cruelty of Ivan IV, the intensity of Lenin, and the brutality of Stalin as part of their heritage. Intense people. And uh, incredible poetry, incredible art, incredible people. Well, let's talk about their allies. We've, we've tried to clarify and, and substantiate our identity of Magog with the Scythians. What about the allies that are listed in 
Ezekiel. Let's remember we said the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I'm against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws. I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya. That's actually Cush and Put in the original. And with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togarma of the north quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee. Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. Now that's an interesting phrase. In other words, Magog is not, going to, not only going to organize these allies, Magog is going to be the one that gives them the preparation, will provide the arms to them. Isn't that interesting? Be thou prepared, Magog, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, be thou a guard or a provider to them. So again, going back to the genealogy here, obviously Tubal and Meshach and Tubal are two mentioned by, by uh, uh, Ezekiel. Gomer is mentioned by Ezekiel. Cush and Put uh, are North Africa and the Dark Africa, respectively. And Elam, over in the Sh line of Shem, is mentioned there. And uh, so Japheth, Gomer, according to Herodotus and Plutarch and other writers, refers to the Sumerians settled along the Danube and the Rhine. We've talked about them already. Ashkenaz is a, a, and refers to uh, root of Germany. Riphath is mentioned by Josephus. Interestingly enough, the name for Europe doesn't, it seems a little strange, but it's actually derived from Riphath. Tagarma refers to the Armenians. The Armenians to this day call themselves the House of Tagarma, but it would also include Turkey and Turkestan. And of course, Magon, the Scythians, we've, we've, I think, dealt with that with Hesiod and Herodotus and other, Philo Jephus, Josephus and others. So, okay, Japheth uh, also has Medai, the Medes, which today are known as the Kurds. And uh, then we have Tubal and Meshech. Both of these were major, t were not only individuals, but they also gave their name to ancient towns, uh, prim prominent towns in eastern Anatolia, which today is Turkey. And uh, the uh, the... Eastern two-thirds of Turkey is what used to be Anatolia. And, uh, and there are others here, too. Yavin is Ionia, Greece, and those. Okay, we have under uh, the Yavin, we have, among others, we have Tarshish. We're going to talk more about Tarshish when we see them referred to specifically by Ezekiel. That takes care of Japheth, and let's talk about Shem, from, from whom comes Elam, Asher, Arphaxad. And Arphaxad is important to us as biblical uh, uh, students because from that line comes Selah, Eber, Peleg, and then um, uh, out of Peleg we have uh, eventually Abraham. So the line of Abraham traces itself back through Arphaxad, back to Shem. But uh, Aram being the Aramaic, uh, or what we would today call the Syrians maybe, um, but we have the main one here is Abraham from our point of view. But Elam is mentioned in Ezekiel as the principal, the first mentioned ally of the allies supporting Magog. So here we are. Here's the map. There's Israel. There's Magog to the north. And then we have Gomer, Meshach, Tubal, uh, all the rest of them, uh, all joining in an attempt to invade Israel. But it's an attempt that's ill-fated because God himself is going to intervene. And, of course, the lead of all these allies is Iran or Persia. We'll find there's two groups on the sidelines saying, hey, you guys shouldn't be doing that. Dedan and Sheba stand on the sidelines. We'll notice that as we get into the text here. But if you don't know all of that, we know that he comes from the north parts. So well, what's north of Israel? Obviously, the southern steppes of Russia. And that's where you, you can make that identity just geographically, if not ethnically. Let's continue Ezekiel's record here. He says, After many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years. There's that term. Thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword that is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel which have always been waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. I'll come back to that word safely here in a little bit. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands and the many people with thee. 
Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at that same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages, I will go to them that are at rest and dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil, to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, which have gotten cattle and goods, and dwell in the midst of the land. You see, I suspect Ezekiel never saw an unwalled village. Obviously, in today's world, we don't wall them in the typical thing, but that was not the style back then. But then he mentions two people here, Sheba and Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take great spoil? Notice, interesting, Sheba and Dedan are not part of the invading force. They're on the sidelines saying, what are you guys doing? Well, Sheba and Dedan, most scholars would identify that with the region that's known today as Saudi Arabia. And the merchants of Tarshish. Now, Tarshish is a whole other interesting debate. Some people try to identify it with Spain and other places, but they haven't done enough homework. Tarshish, we know from 1 Kings 10 and Jeremiah 10 and Ezekiel 27, was a distant port from which silver, iron, tin, lead, ivory, monkeys, and peacocks were brought to Israel. Okay, it's a trading port of some kind, a very distant one. From the Akkadian, the word itself means to be smelted. So it, it seems to suggest tin more and more. Herodotus says it was beyond the pillars of Hercules, which are the entrance at Gibraltar, if you will. So that means it's beyond the Mediterranean, out into the Atlantic somewhere. Tarshish always had strong ships of capable of very long voyages. That's why Jonah tried to take a, sh a Tarshish ship to, to run away from his assignment. There's a concept called Britannia metal. Tarshish was an island over one year distant, we know, which was, among other things, a key source of tin. Britannia metal was an alloy of 93% tin, 5% antimony, and 2% copper. It was used for making utensils, uh, pot teapots, jugs, drinking vessels, candlesticks, urns, and official maces. It was similar in color to pewter, but it was harder, stronger, and easier to work than other alloys. So that's Britannia metal. Global commerce from Britain was confirmed by archaeological discoveries at Stonehenge. That was in the Bronze Age period. That's 1500 BC. And we know that tin was exported to Europe in large quantities from Cornwall, England, during the Roman period. So this doesn't prove it, but it lends scholastic support to the idea that Tarshish may have been uh, in or uh, associated with the British Isles, strangely enough. Well, continuing here in Ezekiel 38, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people of Israel dwell safely, shalt thou not know it? And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, Thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days I will bring thee against my land, and the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? And it shall come to pass at the same time, when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. Oh boy, you don't want to make God angry. And then we have introduced this great earthquake. Verse 19, For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken, surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. But I'm going to suggest to you this isn't a normal earthquake. He says, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountain shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. Now, this may be a natural disaster that God sets up to accomplish his purpose, but I can tell you frankly that there are warheads 
25 megaton warheads, not the usual 4 megatons that's a standard intercontinental ballistic missile warhead. There are 25 megaton warheads that have been built. And a few of those, if launched at the same time, would alter the orbit of the Earth. So this could be, not necessarily, but could be a weapons effect we're seeing here. God continues, I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains. Saith the Lord God, every man's sword shall be against his brother, and I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. Then I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him, and overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. A very repetitive phrase in the writings of Ezekiel. He continues in the next chapter, Therefore, son, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I'm against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. What it says in the Hebrew is, I will sixth thee. We have an, a, a similar expression in the English. We say, I'm going to decimate you. Technically, it means I'll divide you into tenths. What it really means, I'm going to wipe you out. And I think that's what's here, too. He's not saying I'm going to divide you down to one sixth. He's saying, I'm going to sixthly, I'm going to, I'm going to decimate you if I'm going to put it in the metric system, all right? Okay. I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand. I will cause thy arrows to fall out of thy right hand. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands and the people that is with thee. I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, to the beasts of the field, to be devoured. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord. And I will send a fire on Magog, and upon them that dwell carelessly in the isles. And they shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. I will not let them pollute my name anymore. My, I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. My people Israel. You see, God is openly acting on behalf of Israel here. Which is one of the reasons that many of us believe that this event occurs after the rapture of the church. That's one of the several reasons we hold that view. It's an, and I won't take the time here to defend that view. Many good scholars don't share that view. But that's one of the reasons we note that this is God is openly acting. In the book of Esther and elsewhere, God acts on behalf of Israel, but invisibly behind the scenes. And indeed, he's working with Israel today, but it's invisible behind. This is quite different. Now, there's another thing here that's a little disturbing. I will send fire on Magog. Okay, we get the picture. We've read it so now. But then he says something else here. I'll send fire upon Magog and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles. Carelessly in the isles. That word in the Hebrew is batash, which means in false confidence. They're obviously not safely. They think they're safe, but they're not. It's dealing here with a group of people that are in the isles or the remote coastlands. We don't know where that is. But they also somehow are going to get hit here. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the next session. But I don't want the vocabulary that we've encountered to confuse you. The word sus in the Hebrew is translated horse, but what it actually means is a leaper. A horse ridden by a knight in battle would leap through. It was a major, major advantage if you were uh, uh, obviously mounted on a horse. But it's called a leaper. That word in the Hebrew can mean bird. It does so in Jeremiah 8 verse 7. It can even refer to a chariot rider in Exodus 14.9. This could very well simply be 2,500-year-old language that can be describing a mechanized force. We call motorized infantry today cavalry, even today. If you go and look at an army org chart, you'll see, and you'll see armor, that's the big guns that are tracked, and you find cavalry, which are mechanized infantry. So that vocabulary, don't let the vocabulary of the ancient Hebrew confuse you. If you visit Israel's tank center at Latrun, You'll get a chance to examine 200 different tanks, but you'll also uh, see their main battle tank, which is the Merkava, which is the Hebrew word for chariot. So don't let the ancient vocabulary fool you. In fact, you'll find the word cherub, which is uh, for sword. The word sword has widely become a generic term for any weapon. 
He that takes up the sword, meaning taking up a weapon, not necessarily a, a bladed instrument today. The word cutis means arrow. What it actually can be is a javelin or anything that pierces. It's occasionally used for a thunderbolt. It could be translated, if you chose, today as a missile, a piercing, a piercing thing. Kasheth means bow, but it's really what just launches the cutis. So if you're translating Hebrew in 1611 under King James I of England, you, you might translate it the way it reads in your Bible. If you and I today were translating Ezekiel 39 verse 3, we could legitimately render it, quote, I will smite your launchers out of your left hand and cause your missiles to fall out of your right. One, a couple of other thoughts here. Not in the Ezekiel passage, but you might be interested to see what happens in a Jeremiah passage in this regard in terms of vocabulary. In Jeremiah 50, he's talking about an attack against Babylon, yet future. For lo, I will raise and cause up to, uh, come up against Babylon a, a, an assembly of great nations from the north country, and they shall set themselves in array against her. From thence shall she be taken. Their arrows, this is the part I want you to pay attention to. From thence she, 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 she shall be taken. Their arrows shall be as of a mighty expert man. None shall return in vain. Now, you will miss that in the English. But the word arrow, of course, is katis. That's it's anything shot from an engine of war or shot by a bow or head. In the Greek rendering by the Septuagint, it's a missile or anything thrown, like an arrow or a javelin. And that can be, of course, other kinds of arrows today. But it says, as of a mighty expert in your English. It, the Hebrew term is sakal. The port, in the Hebrew, and by the word, the sakal means to be prudent, to be circumspect, to widely understand or prosper. But here in this, in this sentence in the Hebrew, it's a hefil participle masculine singular absolute. What does that mean? That means it's the arrow, not the shooter, that has the insight, that gives attention to, considers, ponders, that is prudent, that has comprehension. It's not the shooter, it's the arrow. In the Septuagint, it says that the arrow is intelligent, possessing understanding. The New American Standard says that their arrows shall be like an expert warrior who does not return empty-handed. Their arrows will be like skilled warriors who do not return empty-handed. The point I'm getting at, in the Hebrew it's emphatic that the intelligence is in the arrow, not the shooter. In fact, in the English, you can even pick it up at the final phrase, none shall return in vain. Not only is the intelligence in the arrow, it can't miss. It can't miss. So this is what we would call today a smart weapon. Another thing you find in the scripture is the description of the neutron bomb, a, nu a nuclear weapon that's been tuned to attack protein, not real estate. In, in Zechariah 14, 12, this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord shall smite all the people that have come against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. This could refer to a lot of other things too, but it certainly is very descriptive if anyone is familiar with what neutron bombs are designed to do. Well, that concludes our first session here. In our next session, we're going to talk about the technologies that are enumerated by Ezekiel. We're going to talk about the strange cleanup of the battle. We'll also review Magog and his allies today. Who are these people? What are they doing today? We'll talk about the Antropov Doctrine in Russia that many of you may not be familiar with and what the current trends are. And then we'll also deal with some timing issues that are certainly are not free of controversy. But that's for our next session. Well, we are in the second session of our two-session briefing on the Magog Invasion. And uh, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, it's, we have a passage well known for two reasons. It's the occasion in which God himself intervenes to quell an ill-fated invasion of Israel by Magog and his allies. And the passage, the other reason so well known isn't just for that reason. It's because it appears to suggest the use of nuclear weapons. And, uh, but now we're in chapter 39. Now, it's interesting, chapter 38 deals with this invasion and God's attitude towards it. But chapter 39 is distinctive for some interesting reasons. As a student of the Bible for literally six decades, and also as a professional that spent a, more than 30 years as a top executive in the strategic arena in the military world, um, 
I obviously have a deep interest in biblical battles, but I noticed something interesting. All through the Bible, you have battles, historical and prophetic ones. A goes against B, somebody wins or loses, and the story goes on. Only one case in the entire Bible that I'm aware of does the Holy Spirit bother to detail the cleanup after the battle. And uh, that's in chapter 39. And it's my suspicion, personally, that the reason the Holy Spirit did that is to give us a clue as to what kind of technology is involved in the battle. So let's jump in. Chapter 39, verse 1. Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. I will turn thee back and leave but a sixth part of thee and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. Well, we talked, with the, we talked about the identities in the previous session, so we'll just keep moving on here. Thou will smite thy bow out of thy left hand, and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. And thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands, and the people that is with thee. I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. There are occasions in the Bible where it speaks of carnage after a battle that the birds feed upon. And that phrase is also used in the book of Revelation at the Battle of Armageddon. Because of that use of language, many scholars, some of the most prominent prophecy experts in the country, tie this to the Armageddon scenario. And they may turn out to be right. We'll deal with some of those issues at the end of the session. There are several different points of view about the exact timing of all of this. But that's one of the factors there. In any case, thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord. And I will send fire on Magog and upon them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of the people of Israel. I will not let them pollute my holy name any more, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. My people Israel, that's one of the reasons we believe that this occurs after the rapture of the church. And we've talked about this peculiar collateral damage, if you will, where there are those that dwell carelessly in the aisles are going to also catch it from this e event. And the word carelessly referring to in false confidence, the word patash. Continuing, Behold, it is come, it is done, saith the Lord God, this is the day whereof I have spoken. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel, get this, listen, get the, they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, and, shall, and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. Boy, that's it. They're going to burn for seven years. So that they shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any out of the forests, for they shall burn the weapons with fire, and they shall spoil those that spoil them, and rob those that rob them, saith the Lord God. Now, if you read some of the ancient commentators on this passage, for example, J.A. Sice, who published his commentary in 1860, before the Civil War, they looked at this passage and they somehow assumed it must be symbolic, because they could not visualize anything burning for seven years. And today, in today's world, we smile at that. Because there is clearly a weapons, strat uh, weapons technology that could easily provide all the energy needs of a nation for at more than seven years. That's, of course, nuclear. You have an implosion device, a fissionable core that gets compressed to criticality. You have shaped explosive charges around that that are set off simultaneously in such a way as to compress that co core to criticality where it becomes an atomic bomb. And the, uh, we surround that then with tritium gas. That atomic bomb then ignites a chain, which makes this a thermonuclear bomb. And that's the typical production warhead. What's interesting, and now can be talked about a little bit, is the shelf life of a production Soviet warhead is about seven years. And I think that's kind of interesting. I pass it on as a, a, a sideline. Verse 11, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea. That's interesting. And it shall stop the noses of the passengers, and there, and there shall they bury Gog and all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Hamangog. And seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them, 
that they may cleanse the land. So get the picture here. The bodies that are left over, they're going to take seven months to bury. Where do they bury them? East of the Dead Sea. Read that downwind. Downwind. East of the sea. I'm speaking of the Dead Sea here, I believe. Then it continues. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them, and it shall be to them a renown the day that I shall be glorified, saith the Lord God. Notice the next phrase. I think it's very quaint, but very provocative. And they shall sever out men of continual employment. The term I would use for that is professionals. They hire professionals. They shall sever out men of continual employment, passing through the land to bury with the passengers, those that remain upon the face of the earth, to cleanse it. After the end of seven months shall they search. If you've been reading carefully, many, come, many believe from the previous... Here, they, they wait seven months before entering the area. Then, they, at the end of seven months, they make their search. Then they spend seven months burying. That's the way some people view the text. It, there's other ways to construct it, but that seems to be the straightforward approach. Then there's this most remarkable passage in verse 15. And the passengers or travelers or tourists, whatever, the passengers that pass through the land, when they seeth a man's bone, then shall he set up a sign by it. He doesn't touch it. He sets up a sign by it till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Hamangog. And the name of the city shall be Hamanoah. Thus shall they cleanse the land. I find this rather interesting. 2,550 years ago, in Ezekiel, it says that after this battle, someone seeing something the professionals have missed, he doesn't touch it. He marks the location and lets the professionals deal with it. Leftover weapons provide all the energies for seven years. The professionals are hired to clear the battlefield. They wait seven months, then clear for seven months, apparently. They bury the dead east of the Dead Sea. And if a traveler finds something the professional has missed, he doesn't touch it, he marks the location, professionals come deal with it. That happens to be the kind of procedures you can find in contemporary Department of Defense documentation. How to mark a contaminated nuclear, biological, chemical site. There's obviously lots of ways to do this, but I'm just pointing out that this is very contemporary language to find in a biblical text that's written to over 2,500 years ago. Let's move on. And thou, son of man, thus saith the Lord God, speak unto every feathered fowl, unto every beast of the field, assemble yourselves, and come and gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice, that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that ye may eat flesh and drink blood. Ye shall eat the flesh of the mighty, and drink the blood of princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, of goats, of bullocks, all of them fatlings of Bashan. And ye shall eat fat till ye be full, and drink blood till ye be drunken, of my sacrifice which I have sacrificed for you. Thus ye shall be filled at my table with horses and chariots and mighty men and with all the men of war, saith the Lord God, and I will set my glory among the heathen. And all the heathen shall see my judgment that I have executed and my hand that I have laid upon them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward. Ooh, that's interesting. And the heathen shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they transgressed against me. Therefore hid I my face from them and gave them into the hand of their enemies, so fell they all by the sword. According to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions have I done unto them and hid my face from them. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. After that they have borne their shame and all their trespasses whereby they have trespassed against me when they dwelt safely in their land, and none made them afraid. When I have brought them again from the people, and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations, then shall they know that I am the Lord, their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them unto their own land, and have left none of them any more there. Neither will I hide my face any more from them, for I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. So we believe the Magog invasion is imminent. 
The more you study Ezekiel 38 and 39, the more it appears it could happen on a near horizon. All the allies listed there are in position now except one. Watch Turkey. That's Meshach and Tubal, biblically speaking. It's interesting that the intelligence community, the secular intelligence agency, one of the most respected ones is the Intelligence Digest. It was run by the de Courcy family for more than 60 years. It scooped the CIA on more than one occasion. It recently was purchased by Jane's publishers, Jane's military publishers. But uh, Joe de Courcy has gone on public record. These are secular people we're talking about. They, they, they claim that the Kremlin has made the decision to go forward this way. It's a question of positioning it properly and timing. That's their view. Doesn't mean they're correct. Remember, you've got Magog, you've got these all prepared to go in, and Iran is the principal leader here, and Turkey, of course, is involved. Now, Turkey, let's talk about Turkey. You need to understand the history of Turkey and Ataturk when he took over many years ago. After nearly two decades of waiting, Turkey has finally begun to, the official negotiations for admission into the European Union. The two largest impediments to Turkey's EU membership are, first of all, its predominantly Muslim population. Secondly, its refusal to recognize the island nation of Cyprus, which is an EU member, incidentally. And all of this, could, this delay could push wounded Turkey, a chagrined Turkey, back into the arms of the nationalists and the hardline Islamic fundamentalists. Turkey is going to go one way or the other. They're either going to get into the Union and be part of the West, or they're going to be thrust back into Eurasia, into their Islamic roots. They have attempted to join the West for many decades. Back in 1925, they adopted the Western calendar. In 26, they adopted the Swiss Civil Code. And in 1928, they switched to the Latin alphabet. Can you imagine Ataturk, the leader, changing the alphabet of his people? Changing the calendar of their people? They really desperately wanted to be part of the West. In 1931, they adopted the metric system. In 1934, all Turks were obliged to take a surname, and women were given the vote. Ataturk made it illegal to wear a fez because he felt that Islamic symbol was degrading. Following World War II, Turkey joined all the main Western uh, institutions. In 1945, they joined the UN. 1947, the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. In 1948, the OECD. In 1949, the Council of Europe. 1951, the NATO. They, Turkey is a member of NATO. It has attempted to align itself with Europe. In 63, it signed an association agreement with what was then the European Economic Community, the EEC, or Common Market, as they called it. In 1987, it, apply, it applied for full EEC membership. In 1999, they were officially recognized as an EU candidate, because now, by now it's become the, become the EU. And over the last several years, Turkey has been set on maintaining EU membership, implementing widespread reforms, including a complete overhaul of its penal code. So it's trying. The popularity of this idea is waning inside Turkey. In the recent polls, it's gone down below 40%. So that's, that's, there may be changes internally going on. Turkey has a long way to go before it can become a member of the EU. The EU is likely to require referendums of all the member states, and that, that could be the death nail for that. And uh, Germany and Denmark are, are, uh, could strike a final death blow here. And so while acknowledging Turkey's accomplishment, the EU, or the European uh, Commission, has cited numerous areas where political, economic, and human rights reforms are still needed. They keep extending the list of requirements here. So there are some experts. The optimists think it would, could be at least 10 years before Turkey is granted uh, membership. The big problem is Cyprus. Cyprus has been divided since 1974 when Turkey invaded the north in response to a military coup there. The northern third of the island is controlled by Turkish Cypriots and the southern two-thirds are inhabited by Greek Cypriots. And that's the part that has joined. Cyp the southern part, the, the Cyprus is a member of the EU now as of May of last year. And there's a buffer zone between the two halves that's uh, called the Green Line that's patrolled by the UN. And so in 1983, the Turkish held area declared itself the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, but it's only recognized by Turkey. Cyprus, you see, the southern part, is one of the ten nations that joined the EU last May. And uh, the rest of the island remains divided. And uh, the EU laws and benefits apply, obviously, only to the Greek community.
The other big problem Turkey is facing is it has a population of 70 million people, over 60 million of which are, are uh, Muslims. That would make it the second largest EU member in population after Germany. If the, Turkey should join the EU, the percentage of Muslims in Europe would rise from 3% to 20%, and I don't think Europe's ready for that. The opponents of Turkey's membership also point out that it would extend the EU's borders to Iraq, Iran, and Syria, threatening stability. E, the, the European Union likes the idea of having a buffer state between them and the Middle East. If they accept Turkey, they then border three of the Middle Eastern states, and they see that as trouble, too. And they're also concerned about the whole idea of an Islamic nation within which a historically Christian cultural root. Now, they're obviously, they're not Christians, but at the same time, they, they have a, 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 a traditional cultural set, at least, that's very different than the Muslim. Well, let's talk about Magog, or Russia, today. What's going on? One of the things many people are not really aware of is the Antropov Doctrine. Modern Russian history really dates from the fall of the USSR, the Soviet Union, and beginning with Yuri Antropov's rise to power in November of 1982. He was in charge of the KGB in a state where information was highly compartmentalized. So he came to office knowing something that would not become apparent to the rest of the world for many years. Not only was the Soviet Union losing the Cold War, it was dangerously close to total economic collapse. And he understood that. Few people did. The West had long surpassed the Soviets in every measure that mattered, from economic output, worker productivity, and military reach. They were getting outclassed in every major area that's important. So Anthropov was uh, convinced that in time, Moscow would fall unless they had a massive change of course. So what did he do? His plan was to secure money, management skills, and non-military technologies from the West in order to refashion a more functional Soviet Union. That was his plan. The problem was the Soviets had nothing to trade, nothing significant to trade. They didn't have cash, of course. They lacked goods that the West wanted, no one's really interested in buying a Russian car, especially in those days. And he had no intention of trading away his one lead, which was Soviet military technology. He couldn't play that game, not with the West. See, even after 15 years after the Cold War ended, they still gave the US, uh, their U.S. counterpart a good run for their money. So the military thing was a long suit, but that wouldn't get them out of their difficulties. So in the end, Anthropov knew that he had, to, uh, uh, on he had only one thing that the West wanted that he could trade away. That's called geopolitical space. So space is what he gave. And what's fascinating to me about this, this continues the root doctrine that's always been the salvation of the Scythians, whether it was under the, the with regards to the Greeks, whether it was regard to Napoleon or Hitler, just yielding what they have the most, they got space. Man, do they have space. We have four time zones in the United States. They have 11. You know, it's a huge, huge uh, place. So subsequent leaders, Gorbachev, Yeltsin, and Putin, uh, after them, continue the same doctrine as well. The one common thread uniting Russian leaders over the past quarter century has been the belief that without fundamental remake, Russia will not survive. The only way to gain the tools necessary for survival was uh, to, to, for that remake, was to give up their influence. So everything, from Cuba to Poland to Afghanistan to Vietnam, was surrendered, set free, or otherwise abandoned. That was their approach. This was the strategy for nearly 25 years, until the loss of the Ukraine um, uh, raised the specter of Russian and, and dissolution. The Russians have now stepped away from the Antropov Doctrine, abandoned the implicit bargain within it, reformed the government under the leadership of pragmatists loyal to Putin and have begun pushing back against the, Rus the American and the Western pressures. Demographically, though, the place is in terrible shape. The population is growing simultaneously older, smaller, and more sickly. The number of Muslims is growing while the number of ethnic Russians are declining. 
nearly all of the economic growth that has occurred since the 1998, with that financial crisis, has stemmed from either an artificially weak currency or the rising energy prices. That's been a, that's been a win for them, but not something they really caused. So there are echoes now of Soviet financial overextension, very similar to back in 73 and 81 when they had oil price booms in those years. So yes, they've got a rising uh, situation because of rising energy, but they're, they're overreaching from that in the minds of some. NATO and the European Union were once rather distant concerns. And now they both occupy the western horizon of Russia, and they're steadily extending their reach into the Ukraine, whose future is now in play. So suddenly they're getting into the core stuff here. And more recently, another set of concerns, encapsulated in the START Treaty, have cropped up as well. Let's, we need to understand this one. The treaty, the START Treaty, took, place, it took uh, force in 1991. It obliges the United States and Russia to maintain no more than 6,000 nuclear warheads apiece. That treaty expires in 2009, and the United States is not anxious to renew it. Now, among American defense planners, there is a belief that the vast majority of Russian nuclear program is nearing the end of its reliable life cycle, and that replacing it would be well beyond Russia's financial capability. So we're not anxious to renew that. From the U.S. point of view, there is no reason to subject itself to a new treaty that would limit the U.S. options, particularly when the Russia of today is far less able to support an arms race than the Soviet Union of yesteryear. What does that all add up to? It adds up to the fact that the weapons that will be used in Armageddon are probably in inventory today. The weapons that will be used in the Magog invasion or in the Battle of Armageddon, take your pick, may already be in inventory. That's what that suggests. Russia, though, is a key player in world energy. It holds the world's largest natural gas reserves, the second largest coal reserves, the eighth largest oil reserves. Russia is also the world's largest exporter of natural gas, the second largest oil exporter, and the third largest energy consumer. So that's a perspective. Beneath the Baltic Sea today, a pipeline is being built between Russia and Germany. It's slated for completion in 2010. The 744-mile Northern European Pipeline is a $5 billion project that will pump billions of cubic meters of natural gas from Western Siberia to Germany and the rest of Europe. The project has come to symbolize Europe's growing reliance on Moscow for its ever-expanding energy needs. Three-quarters of Europe's natural gas will be imported by 2020, the bulk of which will come from, guess where? Magog, Russia. Gazprom is the giant state-owned energy monopoly. It briefly suspended gas supplies to the Ukraine in the dead of winter in a dispute over gas prices and transit costs. They're not sh shy of using their energy role for political reasons. The EU bloc of 25 countries relies on Russia for over a quarter of its energy needs. Germany, for an example, imports over a third of its gas from Russia. Several Eastern European nations are completely dependent on Gazprom, the Russian monopoly. Gazprom sells a third of its gas to Europe, accounting for nearly 70% of the company's revenue. You see the bonding that's going on here. In addition to European gas, uh, the European gas pipeline, construction has begun on an Eastern Siberia Pacific Ocean oil pipeline to feed the growing Asian markets. Some experts believe that Russia could become the third largest exporter of energy to the U.S. before the end of the decade. Think about that one. During the 1948 Arab-Israeli War, let's talk about the relationship of Russia and Israel. During the 48 Arab-Israeli War, Russia helped Israel obtain arms to fight the contingent of hostile countries that included Egypt, Syria, Iraq, and Jordan. In 1948, that's a very pleasant surprise. Russia was helping Israel fight its enemies back then. However, this initial cooperation, the relations between two countries have quickly soured. Russia is threatening to attack Israel in the 56 Sinai campaign, the 73 Arab-Israeli war. They severed diplomatic relations with Israel following the Six-Day War. 
And then they aligned themselves with the Arab nationalist regimes and gave support to the Palestinian militants ever since. Russia strongly opposed the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 82. And since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 91, Russia's relationship with Israel has thawed a bit. But despite renewed diplomatic relations, Russia remains allied with uh, Israel's enemies. Vladimir Putin, you know, he took power in 1999, he's, but since he has, he's established unrivaled dominance in both houses of parliament, reasserted control over the country's huge energy industry, forced the closure of the last independent national television network, strengthened Russia's ties to its former communist allies, and employed what he calls managed democracy. <laughs> and uh, he, he always points out that dictators have been good for Russia, whether it's Peter the Great, the Tsar, Stalin, what have you. Putin has manipulated elections, silenced critics, and gradually tightened his grip on the nation. He was a former KGB officer, and reports estimate that one out of every four of Putin's government has a background in the military or security services. And uh, some critics have described Russia as being ruled by a power-hungry mafia, former KGB and military officers, who they say have grabbed the nation by the throat. Sergei Metrokhin, the former parliamentary leader and member of the Yabloko party, described recent events as a step toward dictatorship. In a recent speech, Putin lamented the demise of the Soviet Union, calling it the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the century. He's also called on Israel to withdraw from all occupied Arab lands back to the June 4th, 1967 border. He's also stressed the necessity of a complete Israeli withdrawal from the Golan Heights. So clearly he's an adversary. Democratic ideals such as freedom of speech are rapidly eroding under his leadership. In recent months, he's faced growing criticism for restricting democratic freedoms and concentrating his presidential powers. So once thought to be a growing capitalist ally, Russia is now returning to its Soviet roots. And of course, this is a company of the growing anti-Semitism. In 2005, following a string of racially motivated attacks on the Jews, a letter with several hundred signatures, including 19 members of the Duma, that's the Russian parliament, was sent to Russian's prosecutor general. The letter claimed that the Jews themselves were responsible for inciting anti-Semitic violence and accused them of vandalizing and burning down synagogues to garner sympathy. The letter also compared Judaism to Satanism and accused the Jews of ritual murder, and so it further called for Jewish organizations in Russia to be investigated and banned. So we see it all starting again. Some public opinion polls have reported that as many as one-third Russians are in favor of officially restricting Jews and preventing them from holding any governmental or cultural positions. I think this is God calling them to their home. Well, other allies in the Middle East, after losing the Mideast foothold provided by Saddam Hussein's Iraq, the Russians have been building a new axis of power based on cultivating ties with Turkey, Iran, and Syria. So you've got a new axis there in uh, uh, as a result of Saddam's fall. Russia is now Turkey's second largest trading partner with a volume of 10 billion in trade per year. Russia has strengthened ties with Iran by supplying with nuclear related technologies and Russia and Syria have made plans to increase diplomatic and military cooperation. So Russia is building a, uh, their strength there. Russia has written off nearly 75% of approximately $10 billion of Syria's Soviet-era debt. Well, I think they're giving away the sleeves of their vest because Syria couldn't pay it anyway, but that's, they're just writing it off and let's get on with it. Russia intends to proceed with plans to sell SS-26 and SS-18 missiles to Syria despite U.S. and, of course, Israel opposition. Now, the SS-26 is a highly mobile missile. It uses satellite guidance systems to attain maximum accuracy. It has a range of about 180 miles, so it can carry a 1,000-pound warhead to most targets inside Israel. The SS-18, this, is this is the shoulder-mounted uh, air missile. These missiles are the most sophisticated shoulder-held anti-aircraft missiles on the market, and Israel is concerned with the weapons may fall, they may fall into terrorist hands. And see, the SA-18 is shoulder-fired anti-aircraft. It uses an enhanced seeker to hit aerial targets head-on, like jets. Most Heat seekers have to trail. This one, the SA-18 is unique that it can take them on head on. They have a relatively short range, about five kilometers, and a maximum altitude of about three and a half kilometers. But it can be used to destroy planes on pattern altitude, wherever. 
helicopters and unmanned, of course, unmanned uh, planes. Well, Syria is on the U.S. State Department's list of countries that support terrorism. Syria gives up substantial amounts of financial training, weapons, explosives, political, diplomatic, or all kinds of aid to terrorist groups such as the Hezbollah, the Hamas, and others. And uh, many of them are headquartered in Damascus. And I think that's kind of interesting. See, many experts believe that a large-scale confrontation between Syria and Israel could be on the near horizon, which makes Syria's growing relationship with nations such as Iran and Russia even more concerning. However, I always take a look at Isaiah 17, verse 1. I have no idea when this is going to happen, but Isaiah tells us, The burden of Damascus, behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. Damascus is the largest continually occupied, it's the, it's the oldest continually occupied city on the planet Earth. But apparently, it's going to be a pile of rubble. When, I have no idea. Let's go to Iran. This is the big, this is the big gorilla on the block, in a sense. Russia intends to sell Iran up to 30 Tor M1 surface-to-air missiles for $700 million. Russia has been the beneficiary of multiple lucrative contracts to develop nuclear energy for Iran. They've been helping Iran build their reactor in Boucher. I'll show you some pictures. Russia has veto power in the UN Security Council. It's also threatened to block any attempt by the US to impose UN sanctions on Iran. There's the picture of the reactor at Boucher that you hear about so much in the news. There is the generating machinery inside. There the uh, technicians are making some adjustments. However, this is a picture of the heavy water facility at Iraq. Now, heavy water is used to moderate a chain reaction needed to produce weapons-grade plutonium. The reactor at Boucher does not need uh, plutonium. It does not use heavy water. Here's just another picture of the facility at uh, Natanz. And uh, it is a, a your hexafluoride enrichment plant, again, going for weapons-grade enrichment. And this is just another picture of an earlier view of Natanz. This is an interesting picture. This is a picture of the parliament in Iran, the Mazlis, and it's, in, it's uh, an October vote where they are voting on their nuclear program. 247 of the 290 parliament members voted in favor of the nuclear program by standing and shouting, death to the United States, death to Israel. And uh, that, was, that was the, I think, very significant, the order of that, I think, is interesting. Now, one of the things you need to also understand as we talk about nuclear weapons is electromagnetic pulse observations. Many people are not familiar with this. Back in 1962, we had some Pacific tests. The starfish detonation was over Johnston Island, about 400 kilometers above the island. They fired a 1.4 megaton weapon. 1,400 kilometers away, off about 1,000 miles away in Hawaii, street lighting failed, alarms were tripped, circuit breakers, and so forth. There was damage to telecommunication facilities. In, in Australia, they lost navigation capability for 18 hours. The Soviet tests that they were conducting about the same time had this experience the same thing, power breakdowns, uh, damage to not only overhead, but also buried cables. Later on, as we exchanged data, we found out they were finding out the same thing. And we now know what the, that's called the Compton effect, there's a whole effect there, that a nuclear device at a very high altitude does a lot of different things, but the, the most uh, provocative one is a, it generates an incredibly intense magnetic pulse line of sight. So if it's high enough, you can get a whole country. The Congress impaneled a commission of the top scientists to assess our uh, vulnerability. The commission to assess the threat to the United States from electromagnetic pulse attack was impaneled. Dr. William Graham himself, he's perhaps today's version of Dr. Teller, um, Lowell Wood, the whole list here are names that if you're in the scientific community are all very or in the Department of Defense Committee, very familiar to you. Blue Ribbon Panel. They rendered the report in July of 2004, but that happened to be the same month that the 911 commissioned reported its report. And of course, that's what the press jumped on. But you want to go on the internet 
and read this report. You can Google it under William Graham or Electromagnetic Pulse, whatever, you'll find it. And uh, it's there, it's unclassified, it's must-reading for any serious thinker. What it basically points out is that if you launch a nuclear device over 100 miles above the United States, anywhere, accuracy is not important, it'll generate a pulse that'll go coast to coast and it'll take out our infrastructure. Telecommunications, power, virtually any circuit connected to a significant wire will be fried. In other words, it will just destroy... It, it, you're not without power for an hour or two or days or two. You're out of power. To use their words, it would plunge the United States back to the 19th century. One bomb could take out our infrastructure. Now you say, gee, what's the direct, direct damage, uh, you know, direct impact damage? Not a lot, probably. But how do you send an ambulance downtown if the signals, uh, if there's good luck because the signals aren't working? As we learned in Katrina, how do you get gas from a gas station if there's no power to pump it? Where are the major metropolitan cities going to get their water, their power, their sanitation, their law enforcement? No, you've got, uh, this is, the, they, they, came, they began to realize this is probably the most devastating way to use a nuclear device on the United States because of our dependence on our infrastructure. Let's take a simpler model. Let's assume you have your Iran and you have an unmarked container ship. Inside uh, one of the containers is a Sahab 3 medium range uh, missile. So you get yourself positioned within a couple of hundred miles offshore from the United States in an unmarked ship. And you launch your Sahab 3. You might make it as far as Indianapolis. You wouldn't get to the center of the country. It doesn't matter. You don't care about accuracy. You just want altitude. And when you're up there, you ignite a nuclear device. Now to give you a perspective of this, let's take a look at the United States at night to see the population density. You're talking about wiping out the infrastructure of Washington to New York for about 70% of the U.S. population. And they have that capability today if they can get a nuclear warhead working. And they're committed to doing that. Jane's intelligence services tell us that on the Caspian Sea, Iran is practicing firing Sahab 3s from container ships and detonating them at altitude. And it's James's conclusion they're practicing an EMP attack. These are not third world people. These are very bright, technically sophisticated adversaries. Well, let's get back to these others, the Palestinians. Russia's further earned Israel's ire by announcing plans to provide the Palestinian security forces with two reconnaissance helicopters and 50 armored vehicles. They've also sent military experts and security personnel to Gaza to help train the Palestinian security forces. He's offered Israel, Putin has offered Israel his friendship. However, his actions paint a very different picture of his attitude towards Israel. After the Palestinian terrorists fired rockets from Gaza into the southern Israel recently, the Israelis found fragments belonging to Russian-designed BM-21 rockets. See, for the last four years, the Palestinians have used homemade Qassams. This is the first time a factory-made Russian rocket was fired in Israel by the Palestinians. Well, let's talk about their navy a little bit. Russia's Black Sea Fleet may be planning to move its Black Sea Fleet to the port of Tarsus on the Mediterranean. And they frequently use a number of uh, facilities there in the Ukrainian region, uh, Crimea. They're starting to get disagreements there about a number of things. And so they're not scheduled to withdraw till 2017, but already the Ukraine is demanding a new agreement, and they're not about to get a new agreement. So Russia may be planning to move its Black Sea fleet to Syria sooner. They're dredging the Syrian port of Tarsus, where it maintains a logistic supply point, and it may be turning it into a full-fledged naval base. And uh, they've launched a modernization project at the port of Latakia, which is 90 kilometers north of Tarsus, and... Uh, an anonymous source at the Defense Ministry indicated that Moscow is planning to form a squadron led by the Moskva, the Black sea, uh, uh, sea Fleet's flagship missile cruiser, within the next three years. The squadron would operate on the Mediterranean basis on a permanent basis. Let's talk about their assets. They, they, Russia's arms exports in 2005 totaled a record-breaking $6 billion. 
Russia test launched a new warhead designed to penetrate U.S. missile defenses. The new system would make missiles more difficult to spot and their trajectories more difficult to follow because they're able to change direction in flight. That's a new thing. Warhead could be used both in sea and land-based. Topol M is one designation, sometimes called the SS-17. That's their big strategic missiles. It's the first regiment it was armed with a truck-mounted Topol M. It'll be put out on combat duty this year. The SS-27 is an intercontinental range, ground-based, solid propellant ballistic missile. It's capable of hitting targets at a range of more than 10,000 kilometers, call it 6,000 miles, and it's said to be the core of their modernized missile arsenal. It represents the pinnacle of their missile technology, incorporating modern fuel and warhead designs. It's capable of being launched from both missile silos and from transporter or rector launcher vehicles, especially special launch vehicles. And that's, they claim it's invulnerable to any modern anti-ballistic missile defense. Well, that's, of course, a claim that they would, they would tout. Our primary deterrent in the United States is the USS Trident submarine. And it's the Ohio-class Trident submarine. 560 feet long, 42-foot beam, displaced about 18,000 tons. Uh, has 20, it, can do about, it can do more than 20 knots underwater with a single shaft producing about 60,000 horsepower, to give you a feeling of this. It has 24 tubes that are equipped with Trident II D5s, so it can place nuclear-hardened targets at risk 6,000 miles away. It has four torpedo tubes and eight countermeasure launchers, and there are at least nine in the Atlantic and nine in the Pacific at a cost in excess of a billion dollars apiece. That's, those, that's our trump cards there. Let's talk about the Russian counterpart that's presently operational. I'll come to another one in a minute. The Russian counterpart is a 560, it's, it's within a foot. It's almost twice as wide, however, displacing substantially more, 25,500 tons. It's larger than a British cruiser during World War II. It can exceed more than 25 knots, depth unknown. It's been reported as fast as 40 at 3,000 feet, but who knows. It has a double titanium hull with two shafts. Two power plants delivering 7,500 ho shaft horsepower, yielding impressive depth, speed, and, maneuver and uh, survivability in combat. It appears to have been designed for Antarctic operations because it has retractable hydroplanes, a strengthened upper works, and has closed circuit monitors designed to watch the polyas, that's the, the icicles underneath the, uh, to, to break through the polyas uh, on the underside of the ice. Each ve vessel has 20 missile tubes, each featuring an SS-20, which we, each of those have 10 warheads apiece and a 5,000-mile range. So each sub can hold 200 cities hostage. 20 tubes, 10, 10 warheads per tube. Some experts have called the Typhoon the ultimate weapon. Gives you a feeling they're roughly the same length, within one foot of each other. But the, cl the clue is, one, ours is 18,000... Uh, 18, called almost 19,000 tons. The Typhoon is 25.5. And the difference, of course, is the across the beam. We're 42-foot beam. They have a 78-foot beam. They have double detained hulls. So it's a more formidable strategic platform. There's a new submarine they're building, the Borai class uh, su submarines. There, there are two classes of these that were reduced in the 80s, the Delphin and the Kula. But only one new SSBN uh, that's a uh, strategic missile, uh, ballistic missile submarines, was laid down in the 90s, the Borai class, the Yuri Dolgoriki. The, it's a nuclear-powered ballistic missile currently in development. It began in 1996. It's claimed to represent the state-of-the-art in submarine design, incorporating characteristics superior to any submarine currently in service, such as the ability to cruise silently and be less detectable on sonar. Admiral uh, Jeremy Borda, head of CNO, gave, his, gave a, a briefing to Congress where he pointed out that the Russians today are more silent than ours. And even Admiral Rickover, the father of the nuclear navy, had gone on record saying it's more important to make them silent than nuclear. And they're ahead of us in that. Admiral Border seemed to die under mysterious circumstances shortly after that briefing. Anyway, the Borat class uh, costs about $2 billion, about twice as expensive as the others, uh, about the same length. Is a narrower profile, has a maximum submersive in, ex in excess of 25 knots, so it's slightly smaller. 
It was slated to carry the same number of missiles, but had to sacrifice eight missiles because the Bulova uh, strategic missile is heavier, 45 tons apiece. We'll get to them in a minute. About 2005, there are three of these under construction. The first is expected to enter service next year, 2007. The Alexander Nevsky is expected the following year, and the other one, there's a third one that has no date has been set yet. A planned contingent of 10 of these submarines are expected to be commissioned within the next decade. And uh, hairy stuff. Now this Bulova is an intercontinental submarine launched. It's a submarine version, if you will, of the SS-27, or the two of Paul M's. And uh, it, it began testing uh, in, uh, this, in the middle of this year and deployed on the Bora class submarine in 2008. Another development, just to be aware of, is the alliance between the Russia and China. In 1999, NATO defined itself as a world police force. That scared a lot of people. The response to that was that in 2001 was the Shanghai Pact between Russia, China, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. And this is a, a treaty arrangement specifically to resist what they call the hegemony of the United States. And they practice joint war games about every 14 months. So that's Russia, that's China, and that's not all but most of Central Asia have band together as an alliance. That's kind of exciting. Well, that leaves us a couple of residual issues to deal with. First of all, when does all this stuff take place? Is it part of the Armageddon sequence? There are very prominent, renowned scholars that hold that view. Hal Lindsey, one of my mentors, uh, if he was here, would be defending the view that this Magog invasion is part of the Armageddon scenario as detailed in Daniel 11. And indeed, he may, be, he may prove to be correct. That is a classical positioning of the thing, of the uh, conflict. There are a group of us, however, myself, uh, Grant Jeffries, Chuck Smith, and others, that tend to view the Magog event as occurring prior to the 70th week of Daniel for a number of reasons. Um, the 70th week of Daniel is obviously basic understanding. If you're going to study prophecy, you need to master, not just read, master the last four verses of Daniel chapter 9. And you'll the, the, the 69 weeks predict the exact day that Jesus rode that donkey into Jerusalem, one of the most astonishing passages in the Old Testament. There's an interval between the 69th and 70th, strangely enough, but it's detailed that the Messiah would be executed, that Jerusalem would be, the temple and the city would be destroyed. That occurs after the 69th, but before the 70th. So there's an interval that had to occur at least 38 years. It turns out it's gone about 2,000. But there is a seven-year period that is the most documented period of time in the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, called, for lack of a better term, the seventh week of Daniel. Dirt is defined by a covenant being enforced by a world leader, covenant with Israel. In the middle of that seven-year period, that covenant is violated with an, a political event known as the abomination of desolation, in which an image is set up in the Holy of Holies itself. That means the temple has to be standing by then. In fact, that's the key. Uh, that triggers a period of time, three and a half year period, half of that week, that Jesus himself labels the Great Tribulation by quoting Daniel 12. And uh, so we know the temple will be rebuilt by the middle of the week. We don't know when it'll re be built. It could be built at any time. But we know it's standing by then because Jesus, Paul, and John all make reference to it standing at that point. And now, of course, this, this 70th week is climaxed, of course, by the Battle of Armageddon. And, of course, that leads to the second coming of Jesus Christ and the establishment of his kingdom on the planet Earth. Now, the question is, where does Magog invasion take place? Hal would argue, and others like him, would argue that it's part of the Armageddon scenario. And they may be correct. That, may, that is their view, and they may be correct. There are a number of us, though, that have some technical reasons for holding the view that the Magog invasion is not part of the Armageddon scenario. It's an event that is well before then. In fact, we believe, for a number of technical reasons, that it's before the 70th week begins. And uh, now the reason I get into this isn't to break the, those ties. They're good scholars in both of those views. The, the reason I bring it up is the one thing we all agree on is that the Magog invasion occurs after the Harpazzo, after the rapture of the church. So we're not looking for the Magog invasion to take place next month or next year. We couldn't not, we watch it with great interest as it gets prepared because we believe that the Harbats will take place first. Let me phrase it another way. Let's assume you're going down 
the street or to the mall of your town and you notice all the stores that are decorating for Christmas, then you realize that Thanksgiving is not very far away. And that's, that's our analysis here. We think that the Harpazu will precede all of this. So the more it seems that the Magog invasion is getting positioned, the sooner that Harpazu will take place. So we think it's part of the 70 week because the Magog forces come from the north in Armageddon, they come from the whole earth. The Magog and its allies come to take spoil. At Armageddon, they come with the agenda to destroy the Jews. The seventh month cleanup would seem to be inconsistent with Israel's flight to Basra and all that other that accompanies the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Armageddon scenario. The seven years energy requirement seems inconsistent with the establishment of the millennium. Why do they just need it for seven years? And there is no mention of any other key end time elements. There's no mention of the coming world leader, the Antichrist, or the rise of Babylon, or its fall, or any of that sort of thing. So those are the reasons we hold the view. doesn't mean we're right. I just share with you so you understand our prejudice. Okay, we've talked about uh, the placement. There's a third possible placement that confuses many people, and that's Revelation 20. You may recall in Revelation, in this climactic chapter, after the millennium, it says, when the thousand years are expired, Satan will be loosed out of his prison and shall go out and deceive the nations which are in, all, in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Many people see that Gog and Magog and presume that's what Ezekiel was talking about. And, uh, but it's not that simple. We believe that, that what is being alluded to there is a reprise of of what happened before the millennium. This is not to be confused with Ezekiel 38 and 39. Why? Because it's from the north, not from the four corners of the earth. It's before the second coming. It's the event that wakes Israel up to the reality that they've been missing. And so it's before the second coming. Obviously, Revelation 20 is not only after the second coming, it's after a thousand years of his rule. So the time, the place, and the participants are actually quite different. Gog and Magog will have by then become an idiom of a similar battle. It's an idiom of a similar battle. Now another question is, well, how can Gog and Magog show up again? Well, Magog can. It's a people. The Russian people will be around a thousand years from now. Okay, that's, who is Gog? Well, here is a little surprise. How can Gog still be alive after a thousand years? Well, who is Gog? I was on another trek looking for something else, and I happened to be looking at Amos chapter 7, verse 1, from our Amos commentary. And when you read Amos 7, 1, it says, Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, he formed grasshoppers in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth. And lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. Well, what on earth does that mean? Well, I was wrestling with this verse in preparation of our Amos commentary, and uh, so I decided to look it up, among other things, in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which was done three centuries before Christ, for, for Christ's ministry. Our, our, our translation is from the Masoretic text, which is run in the 9th century AD. So the uh, Septuagint is over a thousand years earlier for the, of the Old Testament. And when you read it in the Septuagint, uh, it's different. It says, in effect, it's in Greek, of course, but it says, in effect, thus the Lord showed me, and behold, a swarm of locusts were coming, and behold, one of the young devastating locusts was Gog the king. You know, it always puzzled me, why would somebody so important like Gog in the Bible, I mean, usually when there's a key personage of some kind, there's some background, there's some linkages to it, and Gog shows up in Ezekiel sort of alone just from nowhere. Well, it turns out that there's a reference here in, Ezekiel, in, in Amos 7 verse 1 that the Septuagint translators found. Now, why is there a difference? It turns out when you analyze the subtleties of the Hebrew, a little small mark changes the whole picture. That was either a blemish or something. In the, that's why the Messerites missed that. But in any case, it's Gog the king. And... Uh, now, that turns out to be extremely significant for lots of reasons, that one of the young devastating locusts was Gog the king. 
Now, if you've done your homework when you're studying Revelation 9, you know that the locusts have no king. Proverbs 30, verse 27 tells us the locusts have no king. Why is that important? Well, in Revelation 9, when you study Revelation, it speaks of the locusts there had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is in the Hebrew tongue, Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue, he hath his name, Apollyon. As you analyze this, you, you understand from Proverbs 30, verse 27, that a natural, natural locusts don't have a king. The locusts in Revelation 9, thus, are obviously a demon horde. They're using the term locusts like a, 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 as, as an idiom. And that's also the clue, then, to Amos 7.1, because Gog the, there is the king of the locusts. So that tells you that Gog is a title. You can tell that from the context of Ezekiel, that he's the leader of Magog. But the Bible takes the point of view that Gog is, the, is a demonic king. It's a title of a demonic king. That's why Gog can show up a thousand years in the millennium. It's, again, a demonic king that's behind whatever's going on there. So we're together there. One last verse to remind you of something we said, but I want to put it in focus. Back there in verse 6 of chapter 39, God says, I will send fire on Magog. Yeah, we got that. And among them that dwell carelessly in the isles. In other words, it falls not only on Magog and his bands, but also on them that aren't involved directly. On them that dwell carelessly in false confidence in the isles. They dwell carelessly. The word there is batash, in false confidence. There is a view held by some, I'd say a suspicion might be more accurate, that maybe that's the United States. Why? Maybe God uses, the, maybe there's a brinksmanship situation, like the 13-day event back in the Cuban Missile Crisis, except it goes bad. In other words, it's our missiles that are used by God to wipe out Magog and his allies, yes. But, he may also use that opportunity for us to sustain an overdue judgment on ourselves. God says, I will send fire on Magog and among them that dwell carelessly or in false confidence in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. There are some scholars studying this that have the suspicion that maybe this is just a hint of an exchange between Magog and its protagonist on behalf of Israel, namely the United States. That's a possibility. Now, the more you know about the details of Ezekiel 38 and 39, and the more you know about what's really going on in the current geopolitical horizon, the more it seems that this is get, everything's getting into a position to happen soon. And if that's true, there's another disturbing note I'll leave you to think through. It's disturbing to notice that in the end time scenario, Iran is a major player. But it's also been disturbing to any serious student of prophecy that the United States is, a conspicuous, is conspicuous in any absence of mention during the final end time scenario. One of the mysteries that we, as you travel across the country, there are two questions we get confronted with, are the most predictable ones. Chuck, where's the United States in prophecy? There isn't any explicit answer, in my view, other than Hosea 4 through 14. We have materials on that. But the corollary question is, why hasn't God judged America? Billy Graham quipped several decades ago, if God doesn't judge America, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And you can build a real case that we're long overdue, having abandoned our heritage and continuing to abandon our heritage, that we are overdue for a judgment. So be also ready, because if all this is true, if it's coming, then the rapture's coming sooner. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. And the real question here is not about Russia or Magog. What's your action plan? Is, what is God calling you to do? Are you saved? If not, deal with that. Accept the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, and nail down your destiny throughout eternity. You say, well, I, I've saved, I, I accepted Christ a long time ago. That's why I'm listening to you, Chuck. Well, great. What's God, what have you done with it? If you're saved, what have you done with it? What is God calling you to do? He didn't call you, but for a reason. So I'm going to suggest to you to everyone that's in this room and listening to my voice, that you make a resolve to raise the bar on your personal walk. Every one of us, me included, needs to raise the bar on our walk. Every one, none of us, God is not finished with any of us yet. Raise the bar on your personal walk. That requires a conscious commitment, a diligent commitment. He always rewards the diligent. How do you do that? Well, one of the most powerful things you can do 
They obviously want to get into a systematic study of the Word of God. No question about that. But one of the most powerful ways to do that is in a small group. If you're not attending a small group during the week, studying the Word of God, then you're missing the most exciting growth opportunity available to you. In the 60 years I've studied the Bible, I've seen people grow in small groups where they're accountable and they can ask questions without embarrassment. In small groups. Get into a small group, find one. If you can't find one, start one. We'll help you. We'll be glad to do it. And, of course, that should be part of committing to a systematic program to really learn your Bible. Devotional reading, my daily little reading, that's great. No, I'm talking about a serious study of the Word of God. Take it on. And uh, I, respond to his calling right now, because the time is short. And you want to discover what God would have of you in the days that remain. Lots of opportunities. There are self-study materials. We've been producing them for decades. They were well-known. You can check them out on our website, chaos.org. But we also have online study courses that you can get university credit for. You can, in the privacy of your home, on the internet, you can take courses that will give you university academic credit. Or you can just do it in standalone and be part of an international fellowship that we're organizing. We have leadership roundtables in all the major cities from time to time. And uh, we're under a trust offshore. The Courtney House is a publisher, one of the largest electronic publishers. And we pioneered some of the DVDs and uh, CD-ROMs and MP3 and all of that. Check our website out if you haven't discovered it, www.khouse.org. Uh, uh, no one can pronounce Koinonia House, let alone spell it. Everyone calls us K-House. khouse.org is the website, and we have an online fellowship there. But we also have a think tank for th serious Christians, for thinking Christians. And we do strategic studies. You've seen the benefits of some of that. This is just a, high, just a quick highlight of some of it here. We have a network of research associates around the world in key places that keep us abreast of what we need to know. We have graduate course credit for all of, all of our commentaries also converted into courses that you can get graduate school credit for. So that's what we're all about. Our institute is on three tracks. The Berean track to study the Word of God verse by verse. The Issachar track to understand the times. And the Coitus track. Be like the Bereans who receive the Word of God with all openness of mind, but search the Scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. Be a serious student of the Bible. The Issachar track comes from 1 Chronicles 12.32. Be like the sons of Issachar who understood the times and knew what their country had to do. And the Koinos track, we springboard from the third commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. We believe that has nothing to do with vocabulary. It has to do with ambassadorship. If you're going to be an ambassador of the king, you better be prepared to represent him faithfully and competently. And so we have, all these things are eligible for uh, uh, university credit. We work most closely with Louisiana Baptist University. We've graduated a number of PhDs and master's degrees already. And uh, so you can go through learn the Bible and all through them, through verse by verse through the Bible. You can go through introduction to prophecy and become, understand the strategic trends, then become an expert in one of them. And be, and be a research associate in that area. And the Koinos track, of course, is spiritual hygiene to begin with, small group participation, and then other forms of responsibility. We have medallions that will measure or you know, various levels of achievement in a balanced program across all three, and that's what we're all about. Our logo is, has the, uh, uh, for now we see through a glass darkly, then face to face on the inside, and it has the Shema, the great commandment around the perimeter. So that's who we are, the Koine Institute. Come join us.